Hello, my name is Matthew Carmona. Um, I'm a professor at the Bartlett School of Planning in UCL. And today I'm going to be talking about the monitoring and evaluation that we did for the National Model Design Code Phase 1 pilot programme uh, commissioned by the Department for Leveling Up uh, Housing and Communities and the Planning Advisory Service and recently published uh, in a report. Now the programme itself was a six month programme uh, involving 16 councils spread across uh, 15 pilot teams sharing 14 pots of uh, £50,000 from the government, uh, with two of the pilot teams in the same authority. It covered every region of the country, every type of authority from rural to, to, to urban, different scales uh, from authority wide codes to those dealing just with particular sites, and also all the different phases uh, of coding. To add to the complexity, all of the pilot teams were starting from different places and, and were on different trajectories. Um, and not all of the pilot teams, for example, even began with the intention of producing a code at all. Some were just focusing on particular parts of, of maybe analysing their context. Um, and in fact, we, th th there were eight uh, design codes produced after the end of the six months. With regard to the monitoring and evaluation itself, that was in uh, two stages, largely based around two sets of comprehensive interviews that we did with the teams. Um, but we also analysed the content of the various reports they produced and the final codes, those that produced codes. We did it in four phases, or we looked at four phases during that process, uh, inputs into coding, uh, the processes of coding, the outputs from coding, and any anticipated impacts. Of course, it was too early to actually see anything on the ground after just a six month testing program. And all this led to some very rich uh, interview data in particular that we were able to use to produce our report. So what did we find? Well, we can structure our findings into 21 lessons that I'm going to dash through very, very quickly. Uh, and at the end, I'll also tell you how to download our full report um, and to read a little bit more detail about the 21 recommendations. But uh, let's look first at the inputs to coding. Um, and we start here with three uh, important findings. First, design codes were seen by all as a tangible demonstration of commitment to design quality and, and came in three types. Site-specific design coding, which was used to optimise responsiveness of development to local conditions and character. Uh, Area-based coding, which was used to capture multiple smaller sites within an area of uh, reasonably uniform character, uh, although typically uh, as a precursor to, to site-specific codes and authority-wide coding, which was seen as a means to tackle common authority-wide uh, design problems. In fact, most of the pilots in the first phase looked to code at the site-specific scale, as this was where they felt the real problems lay and where they could have the most impact quickly. Interestingly, the pilots often disrupted the usual design coding process in which codes historically have been seen as vision delivery tools being prepared following and in order to deliver or implement a master plan. Instead, by preparing design codes in advance of such an agreed site-based vision, design codes in the pilots were placed in a new vision defining role. And this tended to result in more strategic design codes focusing on key design principles rather than on uh, detailed parameters for implementation, for example. It goes without saying that sorting out the resources, skills, capacity, and organizational barriers to preparing design codes is critical. And we all know about the challenges that local planning authorities face, but it's difficult to underestimate the vehemence with which the pilot teams drove home these messages that to move beyond the usual process of waiting until developers are in place and then being led by them 
requires that local authorities have access to design skills and capacity. Now, the next two findings are largely self-explanatory. First, providing policy hooks in the local plan uh, was seen as a vital component of giving design codes the necessary status. And then um, somehow bringing highways uh, authorities on board with local design aspirations, which was seen as absolutely key if coding was to be successful. Although often the pilots met resistance in doing this from highways authorities wedded to their own um, particular highway standards. Moving on to the process of coding, we start with the seemingly obvious point that there is no single one size fits all coding process. In this regard, the good news is that uh, pilot teams have been able to successfully adapt the national model design code processes to local circumstances. Uh, but some locations are inherently more complex to code than others, of course. Uh, given them different delivery constraints, for example, low, low market uh, value areas. And there's a need to be realistic about local conditions whilst remaining positive and ambitious about design quality. Coming to a particularly important finding, the pilots demonstrated that the use of area types, uh, which is part of the National Model Design Code methodology, uh, was not always appropriate in their views, notably in relation to coding conducted for areas of very unified or even negative quality, uh, for site-specific coding, or in relation to authority-wide guides dealing with generic principles. Pilots struggled with area types, and in fact most sort of ignored this aspect of the National Modern Design Code process, in part because of the time constraints they were under. You'll remember that the first pilots only had six months. Human authorities planning authority-wide coding tended to opt for more flexible guidance that covered their entire area and therefore avoided the need to create area types. Um, but this should not obscure the need for character analysis uh, conducted at an appropriate scale, typically that of the site or the neighbourhood, at least that's the scale that most of the pilots were working. And this aspect of the National Model Design Code, uh, I understand, is being further explored in the phase two pilots. Turning to the critical input from developers, well, viability represents a major constraint on the mix of uses that can be supported and the mix of housing typologies the market will support. And handling develop, uh, developer pressure on these issues was a key concern amongst the pilots. The key lesson here is that it's better to engage developers early in the coding process, just like high-risk authorities, and in tangible ways relating to their actual investments rather than on the basis of just abstract, abstract principles. The next two uh, recommendations deal with engaging communities. First, the pilot showed the value of early engagement with communities, but also that this is a time consuming process during which trust is gradually built with communities that often had been intrinsically opposed to development. It goes beyond simply asking what people like or dislike, and, and at its best is a journey of education in both directions through stages of analysis, uh, to vision, to creating the codes themselves, and even testing the codes. Communities can be involved in all of those processes. But over-reliance on single forms of passive engagement tended to lead to lower response rates and to more basic, uh, less informed responses concerning community preferences. And in this respect, combining traditional and technological means to, uh, of interactive engagement around issues of genuine public interest. And here we're talking about the more vision-making aspects rather than the very technical or generic concerns, seem to facilitate a wider and more inclusive form of engagement. 
finally in this, this section, the pilots were clear that there is a hierarchy in fundamental design qualities relating to the form, layout, and use of new development that needs to be prioritized early as they tend to impact on viability. And these should be prioritized over the things that are, are nice to influence, but perhaps can be worried about later. Now, some argued for a staged approach where site-specific codes follow on from authority-wide or area coding, or where detailed codes for different phases of a development or perhaps a whole authority build upon the principles contained in a more strategic overarching code um, for that, or perhaps for a larger site or perhaps for the authority as a whole. Turning now to the outputs from coding, these issues span the content uh, of codes to how they are expressed. First, returning to area types or at a smaller scale character areas. Now to be useful, analysis needs to reflect the fine grained complexity variation and constraints that characterize many, well, any urban area. This means that Area types may overlap and mix. And so rather than seeing them as self-defined and bounded entities, more sophisticated approaches may be required to capture the different overlapping layers of character. Next, another seemingly obvious point relating to the need for a balance between prescription and flexibility, depending on what is being coded uh, and the context. So issues seen as critical, such as heights, the quantum of development, its density, uses, parking, dimensions for bin access, access for pedestrians and, and cyclists, tended to be more rigorously coded, whilst aesthetic issues were treated with greater flexibility. Particularly where variety in a and a creative interpretation of context was favored as a particular design outcome. Local character was nevertheless seen as a fundamental concern, particularly for councillors, and almost all the pilots struggled with the notion of beauty and, and few found it useful uh, in either their analysis, engagement or coding. Instead, codes tended to prioritize tangible issues such as landscape, density, height and building line as what they saw as the enduring qualities of place that it was argued uh, defined uh, that local character. Next two issues that we can deal with uh, very quickly. Uh, first, it's possible to code for desirable and rigorous design process as well as for desirable design product. For example, requirements that give developer, development managers the confidence to ask that sites should be subject to character analysis and uh, community engagement. And second, audiences benefit from digestible, readable, precisely worded and attractive design codes, whilst containing enough detail to support decision-making without being needlessly bulked out with superfluous, superfluous material. And in this regard, uh, the needs of different audiences, both community and professional audiences, are, are strongly compatible. Related to the, this is the important issue of how codes are expressed. And clear language and graphics protocols help readers to understand the, the relative importance of different elements within codes. Critical issues should be expressed as must-haves, meaning that they are mandatory, while should-haves are expected, not advisory, and could-haves are optional. At the site-specific scale, must-haves can be beneficially brought together and reflected in a framework or regulatory plan to make their application and significance crystal clear and to reduce the volume of codes. Finally, in this section, communities were fundamentally concerned that codes should have real teeth. Uh, for the pilots, this concerned both how they were expressed, but also how they were adopted. Adoption can occur as informal 
uh, design guidance or formally uh, in the current system as uh, supplementary planning documents or development plan documents and it, perhaps in the future uh, as supplementary plans. And with each step, the status of the resulting code increases, but at the expense of the time, resources and the risk required to get through the process and the ease with which codes can later be revised. So different pilots weighted these factors differently and therefore came to different decisions in this regard. Turning finally to the impacts of coding, um, in this area impacts, as I said, were anticipated rather than real given the short time span of the uh, testing program and, and the absence yet of any actual impacts from the processes that uh, were followed. Fundamentally, it was believed that codes would give development managers the tools to become active place shapers, informed by a clear vision of design expectations. Uh, compliance checklists, performance targets against the code and process guidance were all seen um, as helpful to encourage development managers to challenge poor schemes and evaluate proposals in a proactive, timely and objective fashion. But it was also clear that development managers would need upskilling to take on this more proactive role. And in any circumstances, they will need to be, uh, or rather in many circumstances, I should say, they will need to be assisted by those with specialist design skills, either inside or outside planning authorities, particularly in relation to those elements of design and codes around which greater discretion in decision making will be required. However, design codes were not viewed as a be all and end all uh, type of tool, but um, that uh, changing local circumstances and the experience of using design codes should be reflected in periodic reviews of their content. This may involve formal review processes, perhaps every two or even five years, or the adoption of the sorts of staged approach to coding uh, that I've already mentioned. Finally, and positively, pilot teams largely pro proclaimed satisfaction with tools and or processes that had been put in place, and with their potential to deliver a more certain, streamlined and quality focused development process. Unanimously, they expressed the desire to use design coding again, uh, resources allowing. Which brings us back to where we began. So the coding pilots demonstrated that there are many paths to design uh, coding and that design codes are not a single tool or process. These diverse ends are inevitable because there are many beginnings with local authorities all at different stages in the, in, in the development of their design governance infrastructure, um, but positively um, um, and perhaps more important than the exact form codes took was the journey coding teams had embarked on to get there and the raised commitment to design quality which that represented. Moving forward, there was a sense that the momentum needs to be maintained, not least by being clear in policy when design codes are, are, are expected, where and when other forms of tool might be more appropriate, and who will be responsible for producing codes in the future. Design codes have gained and are gaining a new status in the English planning system, and their use looks set to grow and grow. Like any tool, there will be good design codes and bad ones. And just having a code in place is no guarantee that design quality will be delivered. They will need to be well conceived, carefully crafted, and consistently executed to achieve that. And all these things take time, skills, and resources to secure. However, when done well, as Place Alliance research has shown, they do have the potential to deliver superior design outcomes. And in that respect, the learning from this pilot program uh, and the next phase, the next more ambitious phase, uh, is, I think, to be strongly welcomed. 
The final report is now available on uh, the DLUC website, uh, which you can probably actually get to most easily via my blog, the address is there is on the screen, where there is a discussion of the 21 findings or recommendations that I've outlined in a little bit more depth and a link to the main report. So many thanks uh, for listening today uh, and uh, happy coding to you all.